thank you for the opportunity to outline the main Social Security Disability Insurance policy reforms contained in my book with Mary Daly. The DI program is growing at an unsustainable pace. Uh, unless policy reforms are enacted, the Social Security trustees predict DI will be insolvent by 2016. Based on our reading of the evidence, the dramatic growth in beneficiaries captured in Figure 1 uh, is not primarily the result of factors outside the control of policymakers. Rather, it is the consequence of changing eligibility standards and their interpretation by DI gatekeepers, changes that have increasingly turned DI into a long-term unemployment program rather than a last resort income safety net for those unable to work that its founders envisioned. As can be seen in Figure 1, between 1990 and 2009, Americans on the disability rolls more than doubled from 40 to 82 uh, per worker. This troubling statistic is now well known. What is less known is how over this period, the Netherlands, once called the sick country of Europe for its runaway disability system, initiated fundamental reforms that reduced their disability rolls from 110 to 80 per thousand workers, a ratio that is now below the United States rate. The Dutch reforms focused on reducing the inflow of beneficiaries by making employers more directly bear program costs. All Dutch firms must now fund the first two years of their workers' disability benefits and pay an experience rate at disability tax based on the number of their workers who move on to the long-term program. These reforms provide incentives for employers who are in the best position to offer accommodation and rehabilitation to do so. Most importantly, these reforms led to the development of a market for private long-term disability insurance and more effective case management of impaired workers by private sector case managers. It is this early intervention that is credited with the significant decline in beneficiaries shown in Figure 1. Importantly, the reduction in new beneficiaries was the result of those with disabilities working rather than moving on to other welfare programs. Currently, about one-third of U.S. workers are covered by private long-term disability insurance. The question is, how do we get the private sector more involved in case management? Rather than mandate that all firms provide such coverage, we propose an alternative to better align the public and private costs of long-term disability. The United States should stop funding the DI system with a uniform payroll tax and replace it with a tax based on a firm's experience rating. Doing so would raise the payroll tax of firms whose workers enroll at above average rates and lower it for firms whose workers enroll at below average rates. Employers who bore the costs of both options would be more incentivized to make investments that clear a work path for their employees following the onset of a disability than to push them onto the DI rolls. This is currently the system used to fund state workers' compensation benefits. The best practice for these programs could also be considered for DI uh, uh, changes. Uh, alternatively, employers who provide private disability insurance could be granted a reduction in DI tax rates, while firms that could not be charged higher tax rates either uh, could be charged higher tax rates. Either of these reforms would bend the projected cost curve by reducing incentives for employers and employees to overuse the system. Current DI policy built on the assumption that disability and employment are mutually exclusive is both archaic and fiscally unsustainable. Fundamental reform is needed to restore DI solvency and to support continued employment and greater self-sufficiency among workers with disabilities. Experience rating is the key to doing so. It would bring private sector know-how uh, in case management to the front end of a more fully integrated disability system. Uh, this is not pie in the sky reform. This is reform that the Dutch have already implemented. It's reform that's going on in Sweden and it's reform that's going on in Great Britain. If you look at this table, you can't possibly believe that changes in the health of the Dutch and the United States are actually responsible for the dramatic changes in the number of people on, a on their disability rules. The Dutch in, uh, in the 1980s proved that you could put as many people on the disability rolls as you were willing to accept by uh, very open rules that allowed people to come on uh, who had only 15 percent impairments. We're now having a higher rate than they are in our disability system and we can do better. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So you anticipate our cost to keep going up if we don't change course? Absolutely. Yes, sir. Tell me what you think the primary policy goal of a national disability insurance ought to be. And, you know, 
what should the taxpayers be paying for with their taxpayer dollars? Well, I think the taxpayers should be paying for what was uh, originally envisioned by the founders, that the uh, DI program should be a last resort income safety net for those unable to work. Now, in Europe, the way that works is that uh, the government integrates uh, government uh, jobs programs with government transfer programs, and they have gatekeepers that try work programs first. That's not the way we do business in the United States. We have much more faith in the private sector, but we have a DI program which basically hands out checks. And we have this very weird system. Think about this. You have to spend two years demonstrating that you can't possibly work at any substantial gainful activity before someone in the government tries to help you to work. That doesn't work. That's crazy. You don't provide help for work after someone's proven they can't work for two years. You need that to happen beforehand. The people who do that are the private sector employers, but they're getting the wrong signals because of the way we tax them to provide less training and uh, accommodation than they c can do. The Dutch had the same problem, and what they did was to experience rate uh, payroll taxes and require firms to provide the first two years of benefits. That got the attention of the private sector. It's nice to say that the private sector takes care of a few people. That's good. But it's amazing, the private sector, how they respond to incentives. If you tell them you've got to pay for it if they go on to the long-term disability roles, all of a sudden they'll be taking care of a lot more people. Only 33 percent of employers now have long-term uh, disability programs. Uh, I'm not uh, uh, saying that we should mandate that. That's what uh, some very good economists, Autor and Duggan, out of the Hamilton uh, group have urged. I'm suggesting let's just change the price signals so that people have to pay when, when their workers go on to the disability roles. They have to pay more if more of their workers go on relative to firms who are doing the right thing and providing accommodation for them. Thank you, sir. Mr. Purcell, you're recognized for five minutes. First, you're recognized you. for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the panelists for being here. I have uh, disabilities, and we need to, you know, really look at those. But I'm thinking about the ones that are in the workforce, and, and uh, you know, if you could, uh, Mr. Burke, Dr. Burkhardt, just kind of talk, and you did touch on that, the incentives. My question is, how do we go from here to there without creating an environment where employers are going to say, you know what, I don't want to have to pay an extra tax or penalty here, so I'm not going to hire someone with a potential disability. So maybe just talk briefly about that transition, and then I'd like to talk about other incentives for people that are, are new to the workforce with disabilities and how we can create some incentives there. So if you go to a, 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 an experience rating system, which is in fact what you talked about with right. workers' compensation, you're really encouraging the kinds of things you'd like to see. You'd like to see a safer workplace. You'd like to see employers that are more likely to provide accommodation and rehabilitation. In my work, we've shown, for instance, that workers who experience the onset of disability on the job are more likely to get an accommodation than workers who experience an accommodation off the job. Why is that? Because workers' compensation has an experience rating system, the DI system doesn't. So that's, that's the important point. But you're absolutely right that this will make employers more cognizant of the risks of employing someone with a disability. And if they perceive that if you already have a disability, you're more likely to move on to the disability roles, there could be a problem there. So what you can do is you can simply uh, either um, uh, give uh, employers a tax credit for hiring such workers or not have those workers in your pool so that it's not included and use those for general revenues. So there are a way to get around that problem and I certainly agree it's an issue and we should worry about it. But I think the important point here is that I'm not talking about pie in the sky when I'm talking about getting uh, uh, the uh, disability roles uh, changed. In 1981 only 33 percent of people who said they had a work limitation in the, in the, in the data that uh, the current population surveyed were on the DI rolls, 33 percent. Today, there's no real change in the underlying conditions of these folks, but 52 percent are on the DI rolls. And it's not the case that this chart uh, uh, is deceptive because actually at uh, Autor and Duggan, who are at MIT and, and, and Princeton, have done work looking to sh and showed the three points that were made about demographics only account for about 25 percent of the rise in DI. 75 percent is due to the, the uh, uh, program's changes both in the rules and in their interpretation. That's not me. That's uh, the Brookings Institution folks who are saying the exactly the same thing. Uh, Dr. Brookhauser, <laughs> it appeared you disagreed when uh, 
Ms. Ford was advocating for the reallocation of funds to the DI Trust Fund. Would you like to address those concerns? Uh, I, I think that uh, simply papering over the problems with DI by borrowing money from the Retirement Trust Fund to the DI Trust Fund uh, really misses the point that there are real things going on that need to be adjusted. Uh, so while it's true that uh, compared to the uh, problems of the retirement system as a whole and compared to uh, the health care system, perhaps a d disability system that only costs us $120 billion a year isn't such a big thing. But I think, it, I think it is a big thing, and it's a big thing because what we're doing is we are actually, as, as Staples uh, talked about, we're making people with disabilities worse off uh, by the current system that we have. We're luring them into a disability program, uh, either SSI or DI, that uh, uh, once in the system, as we've just heard, it's uh, very difficult to come out, very difficult to earn enough money to, to get around that. What we need to do is stop putting people on the disability rolls who, in fact, could work. Stop making them demonstrate that they can't work before we d do a uh, ticket to work where we're trying to provide them with work. What we need to do is figure out how to get those people the early interventions well before they move on to the DI roles. These are sort of basic points that have to be taken care of, and they can't be papered over by um, uh, a, uh, a financial trick of moving uh, one trust fund money from one side to the other. Thank you.